London in West London. And uh, I'm the OET course director here. And uh, in this lesson, like I said, we're gonna be looking at listening part B and some different techniques. Hopefully you'll find some of this stuff useful um, if you are preparing for your exam. So I've just shared my screen uh, with you. And what we're gonna do, we're just gonna go through a listening part B paper, but we're gonna go through step by step. Um, we're gonna do a question and just kind of look at a couple of techniques. Um, like I said, hopefully, you can find something useful here um, to help you with listening part B. So uh, if you are doing your exam soon, I hope your preparation is going well. Um, and like I said, I hope this is useful. Just before we start, um, we've got a few more videos on YouTube as well. So check us out on YouTube. Um, there's a few videos there. If you like the videos, please do subscribe and like as well. So you have access to uh, all the videos that we're doing. Uh, but let's move on, listening part B. This is what we're gonna do today. And like I said, we're just gonna work through um, a paper. The test format, I know a lot of you will know this already, so we won't spend too long on it. There are six questions in part B. It's very similar to reading part B. You have six questions and they're all multiple choice questions. You're gonna choose between three options, A, B, and C. All of the listings are related to the workplace. So they're things like handovers, uh, when someone finish, finishes a shift and someone else starts a shift, you kind of, you know, the handover that you have. There's also things like briefings, safety briefings, or a manager maybe briefing their team. Um, we've got things like it could be a training session, uh, a senior member of staff talking to a junior. Um, about some kind of development, professional development, or it could just be a discussion between two members of staff. You could be in a pharmacy, it could be in a hospital ward, you might be in a kind of residential home, but they're all related to workplace uh, communication. And remember, everyone does the same listening paper, whether you're a doctor, a nurse, um, a pharmacist, a optometrist, we all do the same listening paper. The skills that you're tested on in listening, uh, detail and gist. So um, we're gonna look at this throughout the, the listening today as well. Okay, so uh, first of all, you have a context statement. This is how the, the listening questions have been written. The context statement is really important um, and it's really important that you really get as much as you can out of this one sentence. Here, for example, it tells you, you hear a nurse briefing her colleague about a patient. So the context statement, it tells you who you're listening to. In this example, you're listening to a nurse talking to uh, her colleague. So talking uh, possibly to another nurse, we're not really sure, but someone she works with, a work colleague. And it also tells you what they're talking about. Um, she's briefing her about a patient. Okay, so they're just talking about a patient. She's informing her colleague about a patient. So the context statement, it tells you who is speaking, and it also tells you what they're speaking about. And what this does, it just gives you some context. Don't be too quick just to skim over the context statement and go straight to the question and the answer options. But the context statement it's there for a reason it's there to give you some context if you know what you're listening to and who you're listening to it just helps um, and that's really why they give this to you so it's telling you who you're listening to what they're speaking about often you can work out where they are for example here it doesn't say but perhaps they're in a hospital as well so you've got a little bit more of a context after your context statement you have your question. Questions are either direct questions or you have a sentence completion. And again, we'll look at that as we do some practice. In this example, we've got a direct question. A direct question, it's a WH question. And by that, I mean, well, what, where, who, why? It's asking you a question directly. Um, we'll look more closely at, at these questions as we go along. So here the question says, what does she warn her colleague about? It's really important you focus on the question because 
this is really telling you what you need to listen out for to get the answer. Uh, what does she warn her colleague about? So that's what we need to listen for. You're listening out for a warning. You're going to hear a lot of dialogue or a lot of speech, um, but what you really want to focus on is the warning. So really focus on the question as well and think about what are they asking you? So we also have answer options, A, B and C. We'll look at these a little bit, uh, a little closer um, in a moment. But first of all, what we're gonna try to do, I'm gonna get rid of all of that. And what we're gonna try to do is actually answer the question without looking at the answer options. Okay, I know this sounds a little bit unusual, uh, but bear with me. Um, because you'll see really something that happens is we do get distracted by the answer options. And this is common also in reading as well. Um, see if you can do this. We'll look at the tape script in a moment, but let's just give this a go. So I'm going to play the audio. So remember, we're listening to a nurse talking to her colleague. Uh, and we need to try and work out what she warns her colleague about. That's what we need to get. Mrs. Green was admitted last night for pneumonia. She came in yesterday with a cough, fever, dizziness and chest discomfort. Mm -hmm. She's a healthy 60 year old with a history of right knee replacement five years ago. Mm -hmm. She's on a regular diet and has no allergies. She's at high risk for falls due to her dizziness. We changed her IV antibiotics to oral, which she's tolerating well. Mm -hmm. Her assessment is within normal limits, except for some mild shortness of breath and wheezing. Her vital signs are stable, oxygen saturation is 98% on one litre, and she's been comfortable during my shift. Mm. Around 5.30, I gave her two paracetamol for minor pain with good results. She has an 18 gauge in her left arm. Yep. She's got normal saline at 15 mils per hour. Okay. Okay. Um, feel free to type questions into the chat or any answers as well um, and it's interesting I, I can see some of you have kind of picked up on the word risk and um, you're right it was really significant this uh, are the answer options so if we have a look at this and let's just take a closer look at the answer options because as well as understanding the context statement and the question we need to understand the answer options uh, so option a talked about the patient being allergic to antibiotics. Something about that. You can see I'm just highlighting words here to help focus my listening. Um, here, something about uh, preventing the patient from falling. And in option C, something about oxygen, because the patient is breathless. Now, something you may notice in all of these options, a, B and C, one word has been repeated. It's there in all of the options. So actually you can take that word out. And yep, I'm talking about this word here, the patient. So all of this is really about the patient. We know that from the context statement. So it really just helps you focus on these other words. In option A, allergic to antibiotics, preventing and falling, and C, uh, oxygen and breathless. Okay. So I think some of you have, have managed to get the answer. Here's the tape script. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pick out a sentence here. She's at high risk for falls due to her dizziness. Okay, so this was what she was warning her colleague about. Uh, and again, you can, because you were listening out for the warning, uh, as soon as you heard that word, she's at high risk for falls, you knew uh, the answer was there, the answer was coming. Okay. You've got to be really careful with these questions in listening part B, also in reading part B as well, um, and also in reading part C and listening part C. With all these multiple choice questions with OET, you've got to be careful because um, the, the answers can be ambiguous. And by that, I mean, it's not clear. For example, here you can see in this sentence I've highlighted, they talk about oxygen. Now, because oxygen is in option C, you might think the answer is option C, but 
don't forget the question. The question was asking you what she warns her colleague about. She wasn't warning her colleague about the uh, oxygen. So it wasn't option C. So be careful because the same is true also of option A. Um, they talk about antibiotics and you see this word antibiotics and option A and sometimes just because you see the word you might think it's the answer but don't forget the question as well um, because she isn't warning her colleague about antibiotics uh, and also here the information is different it says we changed our antibiotics um, to oral which is tolerating well I'm not talking about allergies uh, but do please just be careful just because you hear a word and you see it on your question paper, it doesn't mean it's the answer. Just keep in mind the question and what they're asking you. Okay, guys, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna do some practice. We're gonna do a whole listening paper, but rather than do the whole paper, we're gonna just go step by step. So we're first gonna do question one. We're then gonna analyze it. We're then gonna do questions two and three, and then we're gonna analyze them. And then we're gonna do questions three, four, five and then we'll analyze it. And we're gonna do a little bit of vocabulary at the end. First of all, question one. Now, in the exam, you only have 10 seconds to read the question. It's really not a lot of time. Um, we've just spent a couple of minutes looking at the context statement, at the question, and underlining words in the answer options. You've gotta do that in 10 seconds. And this is where the practice comes in. The more you practice, the quicker you will get. So let's do this. Um, we'll try and replicate the exam slightly. It is just one question we're going to do, and then we'll look at feedback. Uh, you'll have the question. You've got 10 seconds then to read it and the answer options, thinking about keywords, and then I'll play the audio. OK, guys, good luck. So question one, you hear a patient talking to a dental receptionist. OK, you've got 10 seconds. Hi, I'd like an urgent appointment, please. Let's see, who's your usual dentist? Mr Garcia. You say it's urgent. Are you in pain? Yeah, it's the tooth Mr Garcia filled last week. Well, he's away today, I'm afraid, but there's a free slot this afternoon with his colleague, Mrs Brown. Uh, well, that'd be OK, but are you saying Mr Garcia could fit me in tomorrow? That's right, we'd get you in first thing. Can you wait? Well, I'm not chewing on that side and I'm taking paracetamol, which is helping. Mm -hmm. The pain started when I was eating a steak, so I'm frightened I might have upset Mr. Garcia's work. It makes sense for him to check it out. OK, we'll book you in for tomorrow morning at 10. OK, um, so let's have a look at that, see how you did with that. We're just going to break this down slightly. So you had your context statement. Uh, this is all it said. You hear a patient talking to a dental receptionist. So it didn't tell you too much, but it told you who you were listening to, a patient and a dental receptionist. It didn't tell you what they were talking about. So you didn't have too much context. We only know who is speaking. With the question, uh, it's a direct question. It's asking you directly, how does he feel? I think the, the key word here was feeling. That's what we're listening out for. When you think about adjectives, how does he feel anxious, and worried, concerned? Well, these were the three answer options that you had, A, B, and C. And what you noticed here, they all started with adjectives. And you might kind of think about, well, what kind of words, what kind of language you would expect to hear in the listening? Of course, they're never going to say the words that you can see on your paper. It's never that easy. Um, for example, the patient isn't going to say, well, I'm worried that I might have damaged a filling. It's never, never that easy. They're going to be using synonyms or some kind of similar language. So you, it's interesting to think what kind of language you might hear. These are three, the three adjectives. With worried, if you think of some synonyms for worried, um, well, he might say something like concerned, I'm really concerned, or I'm troubled, uh, I feel agitated, I'm stressed. Disappointed, maybe might you the, use the words let down or upset. Nervous, anxious, uneasy, 
tense. The, the words, uh, I think, worried and nervous can be interchangeable. They're quite similar, um, so it's quite tricky. But um, the other thing to be aware of with um, a RIT, with the listening, is that sometimes words or feelings are expressed in sentences, not just with one word. So, for example, I was really hoping to see Do Dr. Jones. He assured me he would be here. If you think about it, is the patient here worried, disappointed, or nervous? I was really hoping to see Dr. Jones. He assured me he would be here. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, I'm sure most of you can see the patient in this sentence here is really kind of disappointed. Now, of course, he hasn't actually directly said, I feel, oh, I feel, you know, upset and, or I feel let down. It's been expressed in a different way. So this is a useful skill to have because it will help you also with part C with listening and reading. Um, and it, you're often tested on identifying the speaker's opinion or attitude as well. And um, that's what you need to do. Sometimes you're going to have a sentence and you're going to have to try and think, well, from this sentence, how does the speaker feel? OK, let's keep working um, and let's go back to the answer options. Um, with answer option A, we have the adjective worried. He's worried um, about damaging a filling. B, disappointed that he can't be seen immediately. Or C, nervous about treating being treated uh, by a different dentist. And again, you can see I've just highlighted words to help focus my listening. Um, see, here's the tape script. If you want to take just 30 seconds to quickly, please just skim through the tape script. Okay, so I'm just going to highlight this sentence here. The patient said, the pain started when I was eating a steak, so I'm frightened I might have upset Mr. Garcia's work. And we were listening out for adjectives here. Frightened, you could say concerned or worried. Um, so that word was a really big clue um, as soon as I heard that word frightened, I kind of knew it was important. And you can see it's very similar to option A. And if you listen to the, when you listen to the whole sentence, um, the patient said, uh, I might have upset Mr. Garcia's work. And the work the dentist did was with a filling. Um, and that's what you have in option A. It was also at the beginning of, the, um, of this audio where the patient says it's the tooth Mr. Garcia filled last week. So it's the filling he had, this was the problem. So the answer um, in that question number one was option A. Like I said, you've just got to take care um, and these questions can be ambiguous. Um, if I take this away with this sentence, the receptionist said, well, he's away today, I'm afraid but there's a slot this afternoon with his colleague, Mrs. Brown. The patient said that would be okay, but are you saying Mr. Garcia could fit me in tomorrow? Um, and I'm just gonna highlight that bit here. Uh, are you saying Mr. Garcia could fit me in tomorrow? Uh, again, it sounds a little bit like option B, that he can't be seen immediately, but you've got to make sure you just read the whole answer option because he's not disappointed. Um, there's no disappointment there at all. And also here with option C, 
when the receptionist talks about um, talking, um, seeing another dentist, the patient actually says that would be okay. So it doesn't match with option C, uh, not nervous at all. He's actually perfectly fine with it. Okay, so you can see option B and C are slightly different. They're slightly inaccurate. Okay, guys, let's keep working. We're gonna go into questions two and three. The same thing, you're only gonna have 10 seconds to read the question and the answer options. And then we'll do feedback afterwards. So good luck. Question two, you hear parts of a presentation to nursing staff about an extension to visiting hours. What is the speaker to doing? Now, you'll have received the survey asking your opinion about extending visiting hours and doubtless you've got your own ideas about the possible impact on your work. You're probably aware of the evidence pointing to the positive effects on patient recovery rates of increased contact with loved ones. This isn't in question, but of course things must be managed properly. I've heard concerns about how busy everyone is, that you've got enough on your plates without having to worry about extra demands from visitors. Well... We've carefully planned things to prevent you being overrun with queries, interruptions and so on. Visitors will be given a list of do's and don'ts outlining what's expected of them. And meanwhile, managers will be monitoring things carefully to make sure routines aren't disrupted at all. Question number three, you hear a surgeon, sorry, you hear a surgeon Discussing a patient with a nurse in the recovery ward, what is the surgeon concerned about? It looks like Mrs Jones is still a bit groggy after her thyroidectomy. Uh, will she be going up to the ward soon? Yes, I'm going to call a porter. She should be going up in 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, I've added some extra post-op pathology orders. Uh, she may have problems with the drop in her calcium. Her thyroid was just huge. Uh, we didn't see all four parathyroid glands, and we need to check that they haven't been affected by the procedure. She seems okay, but I want her calcium level checked twice a day. Uh, she needs to be monitored for any breathing problems, muscle cramping and numbness, and for tingling in her fingers. Okay, I'll make sure a report to watch out for hypercalcemia is passed on. Okay, if you need me, call me. Okay, so um, let's have a look at the, the answers. If we go back to question two. Okay, so this is the context question. Um, you hear part of a presentation to nursing staff. Um, doesn't actually tell you who's giving the presentation, but this time you've got a monologue. Normally you have two people speaking. Um, and most often it's, in fact, always, it's, it's a man and a woman. So you can differentiate between the two voices clearly. Um, here we've just got a presentation. It's only one person speaking. Um, and it does give you a bit more context. They're talking about an extension to visiting hours. Okay. Um, the question, again, it's a direct question. It's asking you directly, what is the speaker doing? This is something called a gist question where to get the answer, you kind of got to listen to the whole text and you've got to identify the general meaning of the, the listening. It's a little bit different from uh, direct questions where actually you can get the answer possibly from a single sentence or from one part of the audio. But with just questions, we've got to listen to the whole audio. You don't need to listen to understand every single word as long as you can get the general idea. Let's have a look at the answer options, A, B, and C. You might notice they all start with ING forms. Um, you've got detailing, reshoring, and explaining. So detailing benefits of change, uh, reassuring um, their workload won't increase, or explaining steps um, they need 
to take to avoid problems. And remember the context as well. They're talking about the extension to visiting hours. Um, okay. So like I said, with the gist uh, questions, you don't need to understand every single word as long as you can get the general idea. So I've taken a lot of, um, a lot of the words out here in the tape script. And let's see if we can kind of get the gist here. They start talking about extending visiting hours. This is the context. And often this is introduced in the first sentence. So they're extending visiting hours. Uh, the speaker says, you've got your own ideas about the possible impact on your work. Okay. Um, and that's quite significant. It's quite important, this phrase here. We'll come back to this. Uh, the speaker later says, I've heard concerns about how busy everyone is, but you've got enough on your plates without having to worry about extra demands from visitors. Well, there's a couple of words here. Um, concerns and worry. It sounds like the staff, the nursing staff, kind of worried about this new extension to visiting hours. Everyone's busy. And some interesting language. You've got enough on your plates. Quite informal. Um, meaning you're very busy. I've got a lot on my plate. It just means I've, I'm really, really busy. Um, and they're worrying about extra demands from visitors. So it sounds like the, the staff are really worried about this new extension to visiting hours, that they may have to do more work. And you can see already kind of with the answer options where we're heading towards. For the rest of the audio, the speaker, actually the speaker was kind of just trying to tell them they've got nothing to worry about. They've carefully planned things so that the um, staff won't be overrun with, in, with queries or interruptions. Uh, visitors have been given a list of do's and don'ts and managers will also be monitoring things to make sure that uh, routines aren't disrupted. So when you look at it that way, you can see it with the gist, the overall, um, um, the general idea uh, of the, the listing, really what, the, what is the speaker doing? Well, the speaker is reassuring the staff that their workload won't increase. Um, not really option A, there isn't a lot there, and also option C as well. Um, so quite tricky, that question. Um, but let's go on to question three. Th again, the context question, it told you that you were listening to a surgeon and to a nurse. And it told you that they were discussing a patient in the recovery ward. So you can assume that the patient possibly has had some kind of operation uh, or something like that if they're in the recovery ward. The question, what is the surgeon concerned about? So I highlighted these words. What is the surgeon concerned about? Not the nurse, but the surgeon. So that's really important as well. And we're listening for their concern. These were the answer options. They were all quite short, um, and it's always easier if the answer options are quite short rather than some long sentences. Um, with option A, something about com complete results. Option B, possible side effects. Uh, or C, something about the patient's consciousness. This is the, the tape script here. And again, just take uh, half a minute if you quickly want to read the tape script, please. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna uh, highlight a sentence here. Uh, right at the beginning, um, the surgeon says, Mrs. Jones is still a bit groggy after her thyroidectomy. And that's quite important. Um, again, vocabulary. Um, and this is what we say as you prepare for the OET exam, build up your vocabulary. Um, and you can kind of see it's not always medical stuff. In fact, most of the vocabulary isn't medical words at all. 
Um, and as well as, um, um, you know, some formal academic words, a lot of it is informal kind of idiom, sometimes almost um, slang here. Groggy, it's an interesting word. Groggy, um, I guess, is an adjective and meaning that you're not feeling 100%. You're feeling a little bit grumpy, I suppose. Uh, the patient's had an operation. She's had some anesthetic and she's still not thinking clearly. She's not 100%. So that's what the surgeon said and just highlighted this bit here. Uh, the surgeon said, I've added some extra post-op pathology orders. She may have problems with a drop in her calcium. Her thyroid was just huge. So that was quite important here. Uh, and you can see the surgeon is talking about the um, post-operative side effects. She's had the operation, her calcium's dropped and her thyroid is huge. And then he goes on to talk about her uh, glands, that they need to be checked as well. So the answer there was option B. Again, option A and option C didn't really fit here. Um, but again, you know, you're listening out for the concern. Think about the question, what is the surgeon concerned about? That's what we were trying to identify. Um, and it's not easy, the surgeon didn't say directly, I'm worried about this, or this troubles me. You can see how it's been expressed here in a very different way. Okay, so that was question three. This time what we're gonna do, we're gonna do questions four, five, and six together. Uh, remember, you've only got 10 seconds with each question, and then we're gonna look at the feedback. Okay, good luck, guys. Question four, you hear a chiropractor briefing a colleague about a patient called Ryan. What is the overall aim of the treatment plan? Today we're going to start with Ryan. He's two weeks post-surgery for a torn rotator cuff. He also had a spur on his acromion process removed. Uh, this is his first time in rehab post-surgery, I believe. That's correct. Okay, so today we're going to begin utilizing high-frequency vibration to break up the scar tissue forming in his left shoulder joint following the surgery. We're going to do each of his treatments that way, so you'll see a progression over time, how we get him back to a point where he's able to live his normal life. Movement's the key to rehabilitation, and this treatment resonates with the nerves, too, so it should eventually help them heal quicker and reduce his discomfort. Okay, we'll go on to question number five. You hear a surgeon talking to a group of medical students about patient risk in emergency surgery. The surgeon is emphasizing the fact that. If you look at the risks of elective surgery, they're really very low compared to emergencies. Clearly then we can make the biggest difference in reducing risk and improving outcomes in emergency surgery. Our mortality outcomes here are actually below average. We're at 8% compared to around 13% nationally. The emergency patients I handle tend to be older, so they're at higher risk. And when they come in, we haven't got long to prepare them in order to reduce any risks, maybe an hour or two. In terms of patient safety, every minute, every half hour we can use to get them ready counts. That's because the patients we're thinking about are prone to developing post-operative complications, given that they have a range of associated heart, kidney, and lung problems. Okay, and we'll go on to question number six. You hear a surgeon talking to a patient who's just had a knee operation. The man's comments reveal that he's...
How are you feeling, Mr. Shaw? Oh, exhausted. But the painkillers must be working. I, I can't feel my knee, as you predicted. You're bound to feel weary after an operation. It went well, though. We cleaned out loose cartilage from the joint. You can go home now. Oh, thanks. I had an arthroscopy on the other knee several years ago, so I know what it's like. The idea that it gets done in less than a day is still pretty mind-boggling, though. Mm. Uh, you'll need crutches for two weeks, mm -hmm. but you should be walking okay within a month. Good. Give it four months before you put any serious impact on it, though. Four months? After my last stop, I started running again within a month. Uh -uh. Thinking about it, though, <laughs> I guess I paid for it. That knee had a lot of niggles for months afterwards. Yeah, if your body's hurting, it's telling you something. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go through the questions then, and we're going to go back to question number four, first of all. So that's with your context statement. You were listening to a chiropractor um, speaking to a colleague. He was actually briefing his colleague about a patient. So that was your context. Uh, the question that you had, what is the overall aim of the treatment plan? Um, so I've highlighted overall aim, and that's what you're listening for. That's what they're asking you. That's what you've got to get. Um, fairly tricky. These are the answer options. Again, you'll notice all of these words start with um, ING. You've got improving, restoring, and treating. Improving uh, pain relief, restoring feelings uh, in his arm, treating side effects uh, from the operation. So they're all fairly short, the answer options. With the tape script, um, with the audio, uh, this is what they were saying. We'll just go through this slowly, bit by bit. Um, he says, today we're going to start with Ryan. He's two weeks post-surgery for a torn rotator cuff. He also had a spur on his acromion process removed. Uh, and this is his first time in rehab. Doesn't really tell you too much here. Just tells you a little bit about the patient. Um, colleague says that's correct. And he says, okay, so today we're going to begin utilizing high frequency vibration to break up the scar tissue forming in his left shoulder joint following the surgery. So today, that's what they're going to do. It sounds like this is the plan. This is the plan for today. Um, so I think that's fairly important. And then um, he just goes on to kind of describe what they're going to do. Uh, we're going to do each of the treatments that way, um, using this, this high frequency vibration. We're going to do each of his treatments that way. So you'll see a progression over time and how we get him back to a point where he's able to live his normal life. Then the speaker says, movement's the key to rehabilitation. This treatment resonates with the nerves too, so it should eventually help them heal quicker and reduce his comfort. So when you think about um, the answer options, remember we need to get the overall aim of the treatment plan. Um, this is really important here, utilizing high frequency vibration. So this is the treatment. Uh, utilizing meaning using, they're going to use high frequency vibration. This is the treatment and also the side effects are here, breaking up the scar tissue forming in his left shoulder. Um, the patient's had um, surgery and now scar tissue is forming. So they're going to break that scar tissue up using this high frequency vibration. So the answer was option C. Um, it wasn't easy to get though. If you look at the last sentence as well, remember um, that questions are ambiguous. So sometimes it sounds like uh, something is the answer when it isn't. You've got this sentence here, movement's the key to rehabilitation and this treatment resonates with the nerves too. So you might have thought that was option B because of the nerves restoring feeling, but actually that wasn't the overall aim of the plan. Again, don't forget the question, really important. Um, and at the end as well, 
uh, he said, you know, something about reducing his discomfort. And you might think, well, option A is about pain relief. Perhaps it's option A, but again, um, it's not the overall aim of the plan. So it's really important to understand the question and keep it in mind as well. Okay, so that was question number four. With question number five, a surgeon here was talking to a group of medical students about patient risk. So actually it was only the surgeon speaking and um, it was like a monologue, it wasn't two people here. Um, and they were talking about patient risk in emergency surgery. So that was the context. This time you didn't have a direct question. You can see it's not a WH question like what, who, or where, or how. It's a sentence completion. This time you've got half a sentence and you've got to complete it with the answer options. But it's really important to understand this because here it's saying the surgeon is emphasizing and that's what they want to know. What is the surgeon emphasizing? So that's what you're listening out for. Okay, we've got our three answer options. Again, this is tricky because they're a little bit longer now. And in option A, something about prompt pe preparation being effective to minimize patient risk. Option B about types of surgery, can some types of surgery can be more risky. Or C about patients who are at high risk, um, who are high risk, need more recovery time. So just trying to underline words really to help focus my listening as I'm listening. And so I don't get too distracted by the, the other words. Okay, here's the tape script. Uh, again, um, you can see in the first sentence that they introduce the question. The speaker says, if you look at the risks of elective surgery, then they're really low compared to emergencies. And then the speaker says, clearly then, we can make the biggest difference in reducing risk and improving outcomes in emergency surgery. Our mortality outcomes here are actually below average. We're at 8% compared to around 13% nationally. So, so far, there isn't anything too much there. Remember that surgeon is gonna be emphasizing something and we haven't got anything there yet. It's really just giving us information about emergency surgery. Um, then the speaker says the emergency patients I handle tend to be older. So they're at a higher risk. And when they come in, we haven't got long to prepare them in order to reduce any risks, maybe an hour or two. In terms of patient safety, every minute, every half hour we use to get them ready counts. That's because the patients we're thinking about are prone to developing post-operative complications, given that they have a range of associated heart, kidney and lung problems. Okay, so you can see here, really, the speaker was saying, well, they come in, uh, the patients are older, they come in, we don't have a lot of time to prepare them. Um, and you can see this is what we want to do, we want to reduce risks, so we want to minimise risks. You can see how very similar it is to answer option A. In terms of patient safety, every minute, every half hour we use to get them ready counts. In other words, prompt preparation. The word prompt, if you're prompt, you're very quick. So quick preparation um, is the most important way or the most effective way to minimize risk. That's really what the, the speaker was emphasizing. It's quite difficult because there's nothing there which said the speaker says, look, I must emphasize or I must stress. If the speaker says that, you know the speaker's emphasizing something. He's stressing something. But here, the speaker doesn't do that. And you've just got to kind of work it out from these sentences. Okay, um, so the answer there was option A and I see many of you have got that, it's great. Question number six, this is the final question. Again, the context, you've got a surgeon who's talking to a patient and the patient has just had a knee operation. Okay, the question here, the man's comments reveal so I put here the man's comments. So it's important. Um, the man, assuming is the patient, 
So it's not the surgeon's comments revealed, the, the man's comments, the patient's comments. That's really what we want to listen to. What do they show us? The answer options. Now, you might have noticed they all start with adjectives. Again, you've got determined, impressed or surprised. They're all slightly different. Um, and again, we've got to make sure we understand the whole answer option. Well, the man's comments reveal that he's determined to start doing sport again as quickly as he can. Or he might be impressed with how little time he was in hospital or surprised that he's going to be pain free very soon. With the tape script, again, if you just want to take 30 seconds just to quickly read through the tape script. Okay, so I'm just going to pick up this sentence here because I said earlier, these questions are ambiguous. They're, they're not very obvious sometimes. They're not very clear. Sometimes you hear A, B and C and you're thinking, well, I can see all of the answer options here. But remember, only one of them will answer the question. Really important not to forget the question. This is kind of tricky here. The painkillers must be working. I can't feel my knee as you predicted. Well, talking about pain, um, it sounds like option C here, but remember you've got to read the whole answer option and there's no surprise here. Um, so actually it wasn't answer C. Here the speaker says the idea that it gets done in less than, than a day is still pretty mind boggling though. Again, vocabulary is really important. And again, remember this is a language exam and the more language you have, the easier it is. So vocabulary, it's an important part of language and we always say, always say build up your vocabulary. That word mind boggling is really important because, sorry, mind boggling, something that's mind boggling is difficult to understand. It's like, wow, um, I wouldn't say it's, it's, a, it's, it's not a negative word. Um, and the speaker here is saying that the surgery, the fact that the surgery was done in, in a less than a day is quite um, hard to understand. It's, it's actually impressive. That's really what he's saying. Option A as well. Uh, he says, after my last op, I started running again within a month. Thinking about it, though, I guess I paid for it. That knee had a lot of niggles for months afterwards. So again, vocabulary, the word niggles means small problems, had a lot of problems, just minor problems with my knee. He, so you can see it doesn't actually match with option A. Option A says he's determined to start doing sport. Here the speaker is saying, well, no, last time I started to do sport and I paid for it. Um, I had problems with my knee afterwards. So the answer here is indeed option B. It's the only um, answer that really fits. But again, mind boggling. If you didn't know that word, it would be a little bit tricky. Um, and like I said, that's why we say always just build up your vocabulary as you prepare for the OET exam. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're just going to do a little bit of vocabulary um, just for the towards the end of the lesson. And what you've got here, you're going to see some sentences. What you've got, you've got two minutes to complete these sentences. These are all from the listening. If you remember in the first listening, the speaker said, but are you saying, Mr. Garcia, could something me something tomorrow? You've got a clue here. It's a phrasal verb. Um, so you need a verb with a preposition. And it means appointments. We use it with appointments. The answer with this question um, feel free to type into the chat your answers. Um, yeah, the answer with this question is fit in. Can you fit me in? So we often we, we do that. We use this phrasal verb when making appointments. 
Um, okay, guys, these are the other questions, two, three, four, five, and six, and seven. These are the clues on the right-hand side of your screen. You've got two minutes and the clock is ticking. Okay, so that was the two minutes, and we'll just quickly run through these answers here. Um, number seven's come up uh, for some reason. Uh, Mind-boggling with number seven. That was the one we just looked at. Uh, something difficult to understand, quite extraordinary, you could say, mind-boggling. Um, if we go through the other words, number two, again, this is from the first listening, and you remember the synonym as well. I think it was um, worried. The patient is worried about, and you can see here, the synonym was frightened. With number three, again, it tells you here it's an idiom and you're very busy uh, to have something to have. I've got enough on my plate to have enough on your plate. Um, I've got a lot on my plate, meaning I'm very, very busy. Number four, uh, another adjective, we had this one as well. The patient had her operation and she was still a bit groggy. Number five, to use something. Uh, this was with a treatment, high frequency vibration. This is a tricky one, utilize. The verb is utilize, to begin utilizing in this sentence. Something is made, uh, scar tissue was forming. So to make something, to form something. So actually you've got two verbs. You can say utilize and form with question number five. With number six, um, the word quick, prompt. Prompt preparation, quick preparation. And we've got number seven there. It's already come up, mind boggling. Okay, so please do keep building up your vocabulary as you prepare. Um, for the OET exam. Just to recap a couple of points. So remember to please read the context statement carefully. Uh, remember it tells you who you're listening to. Sometimes it will tell you what they're talking about and you'll be able to work out where you are as well. And the more context you have, the easier something is as well. So they're really giving you that context for a reason. Don't be too quick just to go to the question and the answer option. Um, and understand the question, if you remember, right at the beginning of this, this lesson, we answered the question without actually having the answer options because we really focused on the question. Um, so really understand the question, think about what you need to listen for and what they're asking you. So understand the question and don't lose sight of the question as well. Remember these questions are ambiguous. 
sometimes you hear A, B and C in the audio and you can see them on your question paper. Only one of them will answer the question. So don't forget the question as well. Don't forget what you're listening for. Um, underline words in the answer options. Again, uh, it might just help you just to focus your listening um, as you listen. You hear a lot of language coming through and you've got language on your paper and just underlining words can just really help focus your listening on some, um, on some of the audio or, or some of the key words. Listen to the whole audio. This is really important, even if you think you have the answer. And it's the same with reading as well. Um, even if you think you have the answer, just make sure you do listen to the whole audio because you never know and they do trick you. Um, they like to trick you, in fact. So uh, really important, make sure you listen to the whole audio, even if you think you have the answer. Listen to both speakers as well. That's really important. Um, again, really focus on the question as well, because it will tell you, or sometimes, or it might tell you where the answer, which speaker the answer is coming from. But it is important to listen to both speakers. We talked about synonyms or synonymous language as well, something to be aware of. And important, don't stop listening. You only have one chance to listen. So it's important you don't stop listening. Don't become too focused on your question paper because if you stop listening, it's really hard to pick the listening up again. So just keep listening. You only have one chance and it's really important to focus. And you can see you do need a lot of concentration with this exam not just with listening part B, but also with reading part B and reading part C, listening part C. In fact, the whole exam, you really, really do need uh, a lot of concentration. So I hope that was useful. And there is stuff on our website. If you go to wles.net, there's a listening course you can do online, wherever you are in the world with practice tests, um, there's all the usual, there's reading courses, there's speaking courses, there's writing courses as well that you can do, uh, writing correction service. Um, there's all sorts of things actually on the website, a foundation course if you need more language, if your language is a little bit low, the required level, we've got a foundation course. There's packages as well for doctors, for nurses as well. Um, so check it out, wles.net. Um, there's a load of stuff there. And hopefully, whatever your needs are, hopefully we've got something there that can help you. Also check out our YouTube channel. Uh, like I say, West London English School, WLES. And there's a load of videos there which can help you, um, which you may find useful. This is who we are. Most of you actually starting to get to know us. Um, you can see Beth in the middle, she's the ADOS here, Assistant Director of Studies. She, she's currently teaching on our uh, current four-week course that we have running at the moment, which we started on Monday. Catalin as well, um, another great tutor we've got here. And hopefully you'll have the opportunity to work with Catalin as well fairly soon. Um, and we are running face-to-face -face courses. If you are here in London, please do come in. We're in Ealing in West London. Please come in to see us if you need some advice. If you just need a little bit of guidance about OET, we're always happy to talk about OET. So please do come in, have a cup of tea with us, have a cup of coffee, and we're more than happy to talk to you about OET. Um, and that really, that's it, guys. I hope you found the lesson useful. If you are taking your exam soon, then we wish you all the best. Um, and uh, like I say, you know, good luck. I know it's not an easy exam, um, but do get in touch, wles.net. It's been a pleasure working with you guys. Uh, Beth will be with you next week uh, and I'll be back the week after that. Take care and all the best guys. Stay safe wherever you are as well. Uh, and I'll see you around. See you guys. <laughs>